Hey everybody, welcome to episode 150. I'm Kyle, been hosting this uh, little show here for just over three years, however long it's been. Can't believe we're at this milestone episode. And couldn't have a better guest than uh, Mr. Mike Demo. How are you doing today, Mike? Hey man, thanks for having me on your bicentennial. It's pretty exciting. I can't believe we kept this going for so long. <laughs> and that it's taken this long to get you on the show. Yeah. We've only anyway. been at both in a year, so. Uh, yes, one. yes. Uh, but we've gotten acquainted through events. I've seen you at quite a few. You are uh, somebody like, you deserve to be burned out of events more than anybody else, but it doesn't seem like you're quite <laughs> there yet. I, I don't know how uh, you can just keep attending so many. Uh, it's, yeah, it's just I, amazing. Uh, I love it. I think I looked it up. Tonight is my, I'm in Fort Lauderdale right now. Tonight is my 139th night in a hotel this year. Holy moly. So something like that. That's, that's wild. <laughs> <laughs> More in a year than I've done in my entire life. Pretty crazy. Um, but uh, you do some pretty cool stuff. We're going to get into that. Uh, before we do, uh, I'm going to share our quick picks of the week real quick. Uh, my quick pick, uh, there's a couple interesting things going on, and I want to share some of them. Um, one is that uh, if you go to make.wordpress.org, the um, I think it's the core. Uh, I closed the tab by mistake. Uh, I think it's the core team uh, has a has a. P2 there, where there's a post about the recent introduction of a gallery widget. Kind of interesting. WordPress core might be getting a gallery widget. Um, we've got a couple new widgets and changes to widgets recently, uh, which have been kind of cool. And this one's interesting. There's also a, a crazy update to the whole uh, React licensing issue. Uh, last week, Matt posted on his blog about getting away from React because they won't change their licensing. Then Facebook posted that they changed their licensing, and now Matt posted about that. So that whole, uh, and this is, this has uh, been going on for a long time, This all this craziness. But uh, it's cool to keep up on top of it and see how things are going. And the fact that Facebook changed their licensing is, is pretty wild, pretty amazing. You read about that, Mike? Yeah, um, definitely read about that and the back and forth. and. Yeah, there was a lot of associations, including the Apache Foundation, things like that, that was putting pressure on them. So um, they didn't yeah. have to. And that's the thing that I think a lot of time we take for granted is, you know, you can license your code however you want. And you don't have to accept that license. But I think a lot of people no, don't always think about that when they're using some of these libraries. But it's good. I think it's good to have these conversations. Yeah, it really is. It really is cool. And if they didn't, if they didn't believe... If they were really against it and not believers in open source, they wouldn't have made this change. And mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. So uh, hats off to Facebook for this, uh, you know, belief in, in uh, open sourcing code. Um, do you have anything uh, to share this week? Um, what did I see? Um, there's some cool stats that have kind of come out. The There's a new tool that just got released last week called the Cloud Factbook. You can get to it at thecloudfactbook.com. And it's a way to take professional grade analytic data about the CMS market. And it's um, owned by World Hosting Days. And they're using the same data tools that companies spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to pull their reports on. And you can say, I want to know uh, what CMS uh, in this country using this TLD is. And you find all the proprietary, all the third-party ones. You can drill down to weird demographic information. And you can generate some beautiful reports, all for free. So I've been having a lot of fun with that. So that's been an awesome tool that just came out. Nice. Yeah, that's just, like really valuable and yeah. interesting. Yeah. I'd like to, like to take a look at that and learn more. Uh, so Mike, at this point, we want to learn about you. Uh, anybody tuning in here, that's why they're watching this video. Uh, is uh, they're curious, who's this Mike Demo guy? What's he all about? Uh, so <laughs> let's enlighten them, shall we? I'd like to step back to before you worked with Bold Grid. You said that's sure. only been a year. Uh, you know, long before that, before your career was really on track or anything uh, had anything going. 
when you were young and you had a plan for your life. You said, this is career-wise, this is where I think I want to go, and this is what I think I'm going to try. Tell us what uh, you were thinking and planning, and how'd you execute? Yeah, so in high school, I kind of got interested in web my whole life, so I've kind of, I built my first paid website when I was in fourth grade, I think it was. Wow. wow. Um, that's, it was pure HTML, uh, there wasn't even a database, it was just, you know, whatever the case was, um, and then right. I went through high school, you know, joined some business groups, uh, DECA, which uh, used to stand for Distributive Education Clubs of America, um, it's a it's a student business club where you like for high school and college um, ended up doing officer there um, I won uh, third I won a contest called the seven up challenge through them which is where you had to design a website a banner ad and a microsite for seven up for a campaign um, wow. I won both categories um, on that international contest and you know got to meet the CEO of seven seven up and all that stuff so that was kind of cool and I was uh, a sophomore at the time, I think. And then just kind of kept going at it, uh, kept with Indeca when I went to college, which was the Art Institute International Minnesota. Uh, I won first place at website development from that group again, and um, was trying to learn web development, but I already knew a lot of the stuff already. I was already playing around, I already did .NET New, all that fun stuff. And uh, I had the opportunity to work for Disney and be an intern at Disney, and so I dropped out of school. And actually, never finished. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, didn't it? Didn't uh, made it about a year, and then had the opportunity to work at Disney as an intern. Started in resorts, ended up at um, the Team Disney corporate office for a while, learning a ton, making a lot of great connections, and then um, from there, thinking that I was going to do resort hospitality. So then started studying uh, resort hospitality. Think I'm going to school for that, and. Uh, one thing led to another, and I helped start an agency that was based out of Minneapolis. That went pretty well. Spun off and did my own agency with another gentleman at the same time. In parallel to this, I was I always loved travel, so I was doing part-time timeshare sales at the time, <laughs> and uh, for a, a resort company. Uh, that when I had my own agency, it didn't work very well, but I learned a lot about how to run a business, things like that, and then. I had the opportunity to become the technical manager for a health data company um, out of the Twin Cities called Synjistics, which think of it as life alert, but for people with mental disabilities. Hmm. So it allows people to live independently with less staff, so you don't always have to live in a group home. It reduces the cost to the counties and state. And I, was, I helped kind of program their sensors, figure out the Wi-Fi networks, deploy thousands of sensors at hundreds of locations around the country, manage, you know, remote tech teams, uh, made an entire intranet site based off Joomla at the time. Uh, and doing this, I was always doing websites, and the first CMS I fell in love with was Mambo. Loved Mambo. And then all of a sudden, Mambo had the fork, and nobody knew what was going on. And I didn't know the fork happened. I just knew the development died. So I opened up Fantastico and started clicking around, found Joomla, and I was like, this looks a lot like Mambo, not knowing it was a fork of the same project <laughs> at the time. And that was fun, so then I was always like self-teach myself Joomla. I used the Joomla framework um, to build an entire internet for this company, um, for all the emergency response and everything like that. Uh, really enjoyed that. Um, that was a pretty large company. Uh, uh, then I had the opportunity, I saw an ad in the, um, on Craigslist they were looking for a Joomla expert, someone that really knew Joomla, um, and it was a company that made bank websites. They did mm. security and construction for banks, but they had a marketing arm as well. Um, SPC, stands for Security Products Companies, um, out of the Twin Cities. Uh, most of the Midwest community banks and credit unions use them. They've been around for 50 years or something like that, really long time. And during that time, I was already, you know, I went to a couple of, Joomla days, which are like word camps, um, spoke, you know, went to a few, was accepted to speak at their world conference, and so I was kind of in the community, and I knew it pretty well, and I applied, and I got the job, and I took over the management, there was a whole team uh, of the Joomla part of the sites of these projects, and we're talking 100, 200 banks and credit unions that 
you know, I came in there and there, some of them were still on Joomla 1.5 and Joomla 3 was already out at that point. And having to get them all up to date and nice to go and um, make sure that all the stuff ran great and really kind of help them with that position. I uh, was there for a while and then was able to migrate to being in charge of a digital department of a downtown Minneapolis agency called MVP Design, which is a pretty uh, uh, um, his, historical agency in Minnesota. Uh, 3M is one of their clients. A lot, um, they specialize in private equity firms as well as 3M on the print side. So when you see like those target like end cap displays for back to school and things, for, like Post-it note, uh, they would be the company that would design those. Oh, wow. and, yeah, um, for the traditional media arm, and then they did websites and um, digital projects, and I was on that team, worked with a great team, and all of this, I was going to more events, and I fell in love with evangelism. I really liked that idea. Uh, my friend uh, uh, Jessica Dunbar, who was the community marketing manager at Joomla, she went to be the evangelist for Concrete 5 CMS. Tessa Miro, who used to be... Um, on the uh, Jed uh, main team, she became the evangelist for Cisco. And I'm like, all my friends are becoming evangelists. I want to become an evangelist. That sounds awesome. I want to travel every day of the week. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Um, and I was at Hosting Con in New Orleans. Uh, and I was working the Joomla booth. <laughs> and uh, Todd, the owner of Bold Grid, came up. And I knew him from one of his other companies. And he's like, oh, hey, Demo, how's it going? I'm like, oh, hey. He's like, you probably don't remember me. I'm like, yeah, Todd. We went snorkeling at Mexico at the World Conference. I still owe you the 40 bucks for that. He's like, how do you know that? And I'm like, it's, I don't know. It's just, I do. And he's and we started talking. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm doing this downtown thing. I'm applying for evangelism jobs. He's like, but what if it wasn't Joomla? And I said, I just love open source, man. It can be any tool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love open source. I, I really do. And, and if you look at the market share, there is no companies being able to afford full-time evangelism in the Joomla sphere. There's just, it just, there's just not, if you want to be frank. Um, now, uh, and he's like, well, I got this new bold grid thing and check it out. And we did. And we started talking and I called him and I'm like, yeah, I think I'm interested. He's like, oh, you were serious. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I don't even have a position. <laughs> And I'm like, well, let's make one. And it evolved. And next thing you know, I ended up on the, the Bold Grid team in October. And first event was Salt Lake City. And um, I've been home a few, like, four weekends ever since. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So success. You got what you were looking for, right? Yeah. I love it. And, you know, I still volunteer for Joomla. I'm actually on the board at Joomla, which a lot of people find funny. Um, but yeah. what, what I tell you, have heard me speak, I say tools yeah. are tools. Whatever tool you want to use is great. If you love WordPress, Magento, Drew, Joomla, Drupal, whatever, it's tools are tools. Open source is good. Plus, it's good to play around in other communities, too, because you'll learn something you can use in your main everyday development. And at, even then, you might, you'll meet great people, do great things. I tell the same thing to the Joomla community. If, if you stay in your little bubble, you'd it's just an echo chamber and it's you know good to hear what else what other people are doing what other good ideas are doing because there's some CMSs that are really great technically there are some that have really great community engagement there are some CMSs that um, are really good at certain things and if we don't learn from those communities and those best practices it's just doing a disservice to all of us and I feel like we can all you know learn by going to you know uh, you know maybe JavaScript, PHP events, things like that. It's there's a whole lot, there's a whole world out there beyond just WordPress, and I, f I feel a lot of people they just love their community so much. Same thing happens in Joomla. Same thing happens in Drupal. People love their communities, and they don't look outside them because it's scary. I mean, I was petrified going to my first WordPress event, thinking I was going to get shot, <laughs> <laughs> being a board member of Joomla at the time, you know. But, yeah. Uh, but you meet people, you learn. Um, some of it, some people are nicer and well more welcoming than others. It's just like any community. Some people have clicks, some people don't have clicks. And um, I love the WordPress community. I've made some great friends, done some amazing experiences. Um, met you. 
<laughs> so, uh, so yeah, um, that's that's kind of my call. I call myself an open source evangelist. So, because I really just love open source and whatever tools people want to use, that's cool with me. I like that, and I I love that sentiment uh, very much. And this is this is a topic we're gonna I think dive a little bit deeper into. Probably it would make sense before we do to. Uh, describe a little bit what bold grid is because we sure. didn't mention it before it is a WordPress specific product correct yeah um, it is a suite of plugins for WordPress that makes WordPress easier to use no matter where you are on the spectrum so if you look at it from a beginner somebody who's never touched a website in their lives they want to get going you can kick out a full website in about 45 minutes beginning to end using one of the few onboarding experiences of WordPress and when I mean onboarding, I mean that hand-holdy, step-by-step, Wix or Weebly, like, user journey. What's your industry? What is, you know, oh, you're a restaurant. Okay, great. Pick, here's our restaurant layouts. Pick a, pick a theme for a restaurant. Okay, I want mm -hmm. that. Okay, we have these, 30 these, like, 20 pages for restaurants. A menu page, a specials page, a reservation page. Which ones do you want? Okay, great. Next, give us your info, your location, your email, your social accounts. Um, and then it builds the whole site for them. And then it says, okay, now let's customize it. What's your, what, where's your logo? Let's suggest some colors automatically based on that color theory, um, based on you know the colors you input. And then it's gonna update that palette through that the entire system. It's really the Wix or Weebly or Squarespace journey, but inside of an open source product. And then it's WordPress, so you can extend it or do what you wanna do with it. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what most people think of us as when they think of Bold Grid. Um, but we also have a bunch of um, individual plugins too. It's all modular. Like we have a backup plugin and an SEO plugin and a staging plugin. You can stage your your WordPress sites, even if it's on a bold grid site, on your production server. If the client doesn't know how to do local or they don't want to pay for it or whatever the case, without a separate database, without a separate install, without a subfolder, you know, you can stage right there, and that works with you know um, any WordPress site out of the box. Uh, you can also. Uh, we got a drop and drag page builder that you can use independently by itself if you'd like. We have a, temp a template framework that allows you to hook into it and you know even submit your themes on our template marketplace um, as well, and a gallery plugin and other uh, forms plugin that we um, we work with a uh, we forked with a friendly fork with the uh, provider there and yeah, so our stuff's all modular and um, we. Uh, for people that know what they're doing and just want to play, have a certain thing. Um, we have an SEO plugin, I already said that I think. And then we got a developer and agency tools as well. There's an agency in New York City that have a thousand clients that are using bold grid sites. And they just kick those things out and they just focus on selling local marketing services to them. And we have special tools for uh, developers so that you can code a full bold grid site without using any of the drop and drag things if you don't want to but then you can still hand your client that ease of use experience, so it's kind of a win-win. So uh, that's kind of what Bold Grid is in a nutshell. It's really what you make of it, and it works with whatever you have already. If you love Beaver Builder, that's fine. Keep using Beaver Builder if that's what you want to do. You know, I'm not saying that you need to use every one of our tools, and that's why we made it modular, so you can pick and choose based on your needs and your client's needs or that specific site, because we don't want you to have to uninstall 25 plugins or 12 plugins if you only want two of them, as an example. So, uh, yeah, it's very impressive. There's a great demo on boldgrid.com and a lot more information about uh, the features, uh, expanding on what you talked about. If anyone's interested, um, definitely check it out. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all free. The entire suite's free. <laughs> yeah, so there's a premium tier at five bucks yeah. a month, but. Most people just are happy with the free version. So play with it. Let us know what you'd like to see changed. One of the things I don't know very much about is uh, a little bit of history on Bold Grid um, and uh, a little more about the rest of your team. Sure. So um, open up my slides. They just gave a talk on the history of Bold Grid at World Hosting Days USA um, oh. just a couple days ago. And I can probably send you a link to the PDF if you remind me. Let's see, we'll let that open in the meantime. So Bullwood started as a need out of our sister company, which was a hosting company. And 
Boldgrid is now its own team. It's spun out, blah, blah, blah. But it kind of came started in 2014 because they were seeing high cancellation rates for WordPress hosting. Mm. And they were trying to figure out why was that. And we did, they did studies. The team did studies with people that wanted websites and things. And we determined that everybody has that, that friend. That friend who you go to that knows the web and they know computers. And they, you have a website idea. You started a bakery. And you're like, I need a website because I got a bakery. I'm going to call Bob because Bob knows websites. And Bob doesn't want to make your website because, you know, he doesn't want to work for free. Uh, hey, Bob, I need a website. What should I do? And Bob says, oh, use WordPress. It's easy. Go ahead. You'll, it'll be fine. And then so you find and search for WordPress hosting, land on Bluehost, SiteGround, wherever you, somewhere, wherever. And, you, you know, you buy hosting. Most likely, it's probably not a managed host because you're probably going off price in most cases. Um, and you open it up, and you see the WordPress admin. And you're like, what the heck just happened? I logged in, and this is not what I expected. Because in your mind, you're expecting that ease of use that you see on the Super Bowl ad that Squarespace just did. Well, they just drop it and drag and you know, it's just, you know, John Malkovich did it in just 20 minutes. Why can't I do it? John Malkovich can do it. I mean, heck, he has people living inside of him. And what the, um, and that's the issue is that WordPress is blessing and a curse is that it's well known. It's the Kleenex of CMSs. It's the name everyone knows. The downside is, is it has this reputation of being easy. And yes, if you look at the spectrum of CMSs, you can probably argue, probably successfully, that WordPress is one of the easier user interfaces if you're comparing it against, you know, the top 10 CMSs. You know, got Drupal, Joomla, .NET, Nuke, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, Concrete 5, it, you know, we'll definitely argue that it's a better user experience than that. So that's how it got the reputation. But easy to the end user is not what people are thinking. That's why, you know, Core is doing things like Project Gutenberg to try to bridge that gap a little bit and the customizer. Um, and so that's what we saw. And we said, how do we fix this problem? And so the uh, Bold Grid 1.0 came out in 2015. And it was originally just tested on two hosts, in motion hosting and web hosting hub, just to kind of get some to get some feedback. Went through a lot of revisions back then. It was just a single plugin that, it's th that did the whole suite of tools. We only recently broke it out um, earlier this winter, I believe, if I'm going off correctly. Uh, in March of 2016, um, Bold Grid 1.1 came out. Uh, and then we added uh, Softaculous support um, later in um, 2016, in the fall time. Uh, July of 2016, uh, Bold Grid 1.2 came out. Uh, 1.3 came out in October of 2016. Uh, 1.4 came out of March of this year. And we just launched a new version. July 2017, we added our Plesk extension. So that if you are a host that uses the Plesk control panel, you can offer one-click Bold Grid to your customers. Just like we offered Softaculous a little bit before that, if you have a host and you offer Softaculous, you can turn it on and people can one-click install Bold Grid through your control panel so they don't, they don't even have to figure out the install step. And as of August, we've surpassed over 150,000 active sites that have been created using the inspiration end-to-end -end method I talked about. That doesn't even count the people using our tools for individual plugins and things like that. Um, mm. So we've been doing a lot of um, good growth. We kind of did our public coming out party last year at HostingCon Global, although it was available um, earlier. That was kind of the big push out, leaving beta and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of been the history. Uh, Team-wise, we have uh, about 20-something people on the team from developers, designers, copywriters, because all of our we don't use any lower MIPSUM. It's all custom copy. Uh, user experience folks, marketing folks, business development team. Um, and then, of course, we share HR and accounting resources with our sister companies uh, as well. So we got a pretty big team, and um, we've done some pretty cool things that I think are kind of innovative, and we're trying to keep pushing the envelope forward and making it better. 
um, our grid blocks, which are like predetermined sections that you can save and like drop into your page so you don't have to like code all the pieces yourself. We've introduced infinity grid blocks, which is, connects to Unsplash and through our API, it looks at your site design things and will automatically come up with unlimited layout opportunities for those grid blocks. It's just, it will just load up infinity. Um, to give you different ideas and layouts, and we've connected stock images. Um, mm. We just launched with 123RF, um, which allows you to buy stock images for 80% cheaper than you would if you went to the website directly. Cheaper than Adobe Stock, cheaper than um, Fotolia, cheaper than 123RF directly, and you can just buy them right inside of WordPress now if you'd like, and it instantly goes into your page, it's cropped, and all that stuff. So. We're just trying to make WordPress more accessible and keep people in that ecosystem and not get scared away from it. That's kind of the history. So. Yeah, thank you for uh, catching me up to speed. Uh, I was definitely curious about that. And, um, and uh, that's, a, that's a lot going on. Cool team, uh, iterating quickly on uh, quite a set of features. Uh, that, there's a lot going on uh, with, this, with this suite of plugins. That you described, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious a little bit. Uh, so your role specifically, you are an evangelist for the company. Your role yep. is to interface, I, I, as I understand it, with the community and attend a lot of events. Maybe break down a little bit more specifically where you come into the team and what what your function is. Yeah, I, for lack of a better word, am the face of Bold Grid. Um, that's more or less what I am. And my role is, the role of any evangelist is to be a little bit of everything, kind of wear multiple hats. Uh, I connect with the community, try to let, let people know what we're doing, um, see what other cool people are doing, and just be a good steward of the brand, and just be visible and try to support WordPress. And that's why we're global sponsors and we support other events, things like that. Um, but yes, every week I'm somewhere. I'm at a different um, city, state, country, sometimes multiple times a week. Uh, I was just in Chicago yesterday. Today, um, I'm in Fort Lauderdale for the C-Panel conference, and then I leave from here for San Antonio work camp um, to go check that out. And it's a little bit of everything. It's talking to partnership, supporting the business development team if they are working with a certain partner to make sure that partner gets good exposure. Um, an example is A2 is one of our uh, supported hosts that's on our website. And when we're at events, which A2 is next to, we make sure that when people say, oh, what host do you use? We point out, oh, A2 is right there, and things like that, and try to support those partners that are physically there, and uh, while still being fair, if there's multiple partners at an event. Um, and just connect with people. Do support if people have questions, if people have ideas, pass the ideas up to the team. Uh, any feedback we get, good, positive, negative, uh, whatever kind of pass that along and just kind of be the community face of the entire team we have working behind us. That involves a lot of speaking in general topics, um, connecting with people, and just really just kind of being present. Um, the evangelism role is a really hard role to define an ROI behind historically, no matter what company you're dealing with. But I think it has value when the product you're using, you can connect with somebody very easily and you see them all the time. And you're like, well, if I have a problem, I'll just talk to Mike. Just like, hey, if somebody has a question about SiteLock, you'll talk to Adam Warner, the evangelist for SiteLock, um, as an example. So um, I think it's a valuable use um, to the community and uh, I really enjoy it. That's super cool. Yeah, I mean, it's just um, inspiring and awesome to listen to your story and just how passionate you are about it and how clearly it's like you're, you you found what you're supposed to be doing and you're doing something that's very fulfilling. Um, you should probably have like where's demo.com and just uh, see <laughs> um, where you're at. Actually, um, Adam Warner launched a website called whatcitynow.com and him and I are doing a podcast where every week we'll talk about what city we're in and what we did. We've done four test shows. We hope to go live and start publishing them pretty soon. So uh, whatcitynow.com is actually going to be uh, not just a blog, but it's going to be a home of the travels that Adam Warner from SiteLock and myself have been doing on a week-to-week -week basis. 
Um, it was his idea, and I came up with the idea for the podcast because I used to do a Disney podcast for about six hundred episodes. So wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's a good that's a good pick. I'm excited to start tuning in <laughs> as soon as this goes live. Yeah. Very cool. We have a Twitter account that's a little bit active right now, so you can check that out yeah. as well. Yeah, very cool. Exciting. Another fun podcast, and I'm very I'm very interested in this. You know, traveling is something that has only recently become a significant part of my life. And I'm becoming very passionate about the idea of exploring everything that, you know, this great country has to offer. And um, I love uh, talking to someone like yourself who's, uh, you know, been around the, been around the, co the country a little bit um, and uh, knows a thing or two about traveling. So that, that's something I'd like to talk about too. Um, you've been around, uh, a lot uh, this year. You've traveled to all kinds of places. Um, what are some of the? What is the I mean, easy question? What are some of the places around here that uh, that you really love visiting? Look forward to going to again. Uh, that are just special for you. Yeah. So um, domestically, um, it's probably yeah. You know, I would say there's some cities that I love going back to um, again and again. Um, those include like Chicago, New York. Um, San Antonio, I really like, um, Orlando, of course, as well as uh, Southern California. And they all have different reasons. Like uh, San Antonio, I really like the Riverwalk, and I really enjoy um, checking out like the uh, SeaWorld that's down there. They do a great Halloween event every year. Um, so I actually have a – this is the funny part is I travel so much, I can maintain an annual pass for SeaWorld, um, all three part, all three SeaWorlds in the country – and have it make physical sense. So <laughs> even though I live in Minnesota, so um, I also have annual passes for Disney as well for similar reasons. Because I happen to be in Orlando, um, I have three Orlando events this year already. Had one, have one in a couple of weeks. That have uh, Word Camp Orlando, obviously in November. So you know, if evenings and stuff. Um, but then there's other places that are just kind of uh, like special and cool. Like I've been to Salt Lake four times this last year, and I love Salt Lake as a city, as a culture. I love going to Temple Square and learning about the LDS church. Even though I'm not LDS, you know, I've, I have no interest in converting, I just really find that, you know, it's just very interesting and um, about the history of Utah, so tied with the history of the church. And um, it's a very welcoming city. And uh, yeah, there's just uh, so many cool things about everywhere in the U.S. and Everyone always jokes that I have a habit of finding the coolest thing in every city um, because I do a lot of research. Um, I know what I'm going to do before I get there. Um, everyone makes fun of me because I go to every hard rock that I, in every city to get, to get the pins, and that's just a collecting thing. But I also try to find the unique things. Like we were in Utah, and um, I out about 20 minutes outside of Salt Lake, there's a company there called The Void, and The Void makes hyper reality, which end up just recently got funded by Disney. And think virtual reality, but with full roomscaping scale. So when you look and you see, you can see your the other players in the room, and when you look at a door and you reach out, there's a door knob, but you can walk through the door into another room. Then when there's a couch, you can sit on the couch. When you walk into an elevator, you can press the button. So it's full, it's, uh, it's virtual reality with physical objects mapped perfectly. Um, they started, they did the first one in New York City for Ghostbusters, but it's a Utah company. So I took Adam out there, they were doing like a preview night. Uh, he thought it was awesome. Since then, Disney's invested in them, and they're opening up a Star Wars one in Orlando and um, in a couple, uh, a couple months. So uh, called Star Wars Shadow of the Empire or something like that. It's supposed to open wow. this winter. So it's just your it's just little things like that that you wouldn't know about unless you just you know dug into what's going on in that city. Oh, that's incredible. Wow. Those sound like a, a total blast. Yeah, um, I would highly recommend it. You know, go to the Void's website. They have multiple locations now. If you're near one, go. Uh, it's a little bit pricey, but it's worth every penny. Um, this it's awesome. So 
Yeah, right on. Definitely. And anybody tuning in, uh, Mike is totally the guy. You got to talk to him when you go to an event and you've got a little extra time after the conference. Mike will tell you what to do with your time, for sure. He won't steer you wrong. Um, <laughs> so you spent some time at Disney and uh, yeah. you're pretty passionate about what they do. I mean, tell me a little bit about uh, about this company. I don't, I don't know a lot about Disney. Uh, more than the, I mean, no more than the average person knows. Uh, what's what's special about what they're doing, and, and why are they a company that uh, someone like yourself could get passionate about? Yeah, and I want to be clear. I mean, we got people in our community, um, like we, uh, that you know, do work at Disney for WordPress development, like you know, we back end sure. things. And I don't know it from a WordPress perspective. I know it from a hospitality theme park perspective. Um, but I started as just a resorts intern, ended up kind of doing some back office kind of supervisory type stuff. I became a trainer and I love training, love talking to people. Uh, ended up working at the corporate office for some special projects. Through that, I was able to connect with some executives like Lee Cockwell, the executive vice president um, of Disney before he retired. Um, and Al Weiss, who you know became the president of Disney Parks um, back then and it's just it's a company that does things so differently from a guest point of view and I really respect how they have that end-to-end -end guest experience that I find very interesting from everything that they do and a lot of people um, you know they might not like you know Disney might not be their cup of tea but you sense a palatable difference and it, they do it in their training and how they interact with people uh, when I was a cast member, I was empowered to make it right. There wasn't like some rules, and there was never a policy that you had to stick behind. If you felt it was the right thing to do, you could just do it. And when trainees would come up to us and say, hey, this guest is having this issue, what do we do? I would say, what do you want to do? And if they said, oh, I want to do this, we're like, okay, fine, do it. I want to give them a $50 Disney gift card. Okay, go do that. If they said something like, I want to give uh, pay for their whole vacation, we might be like, well, that might not be appropriate for the bus being 10 minutes late, but, you know, <laughs> try, to, try to steer them into maybe a more appropriate response. But the company just does so many cool things, and uh, it, it's it's one of the fewest companies, it's the only company I can think of that has synergy down so well. And what I mean by that is that everything, the all brands connect with all of the brands in the company. Uh, since Disney's bought Star Wars, you're starting to see it, right? Is that now Star Wars are now in the theme parks, and they're not just in the theme parks; they're also in, you know, in uh, cross-referenced in their Marvel in their Marvel movies, and their Marvel movies are now cross-referenced in their Pixar films, and all these different things is they get this entire kind of, you know, ecosystem of all of these different experiences that I find no other company can even come close and and match. Um, and they know how to get every penny out of you. Like everyone says Disney World's too expensive. Disney's too expensive. Disney's actually not that expensive. It is an expensive trip, I'll give you that. But here's the reason why everyone thinks it's so expensive. Can a, can a single mother who is working a, you know, making 12 bucks an hour, save up after a few years, can she take her kids to Disney on a Disney vacation? Yes, she can. She might have to choose the off-season, a value resort, and go doing free dining. But you can do it for a relatively low cost per person per day if you're comparing Central Florida vacations. But here's the thing that people don't realize is that they know how to get every penny out of you no matter where you fall on the economic spectrum. They know how to target you. If you have a little more money, oh, maybe you need a moderate resort. And then maybe you'd be interested in this. I got it. Um, my wife and I do a lot of the add-on experiences. My wife and I like, you know, the like the VIP parties and things. And so we went, we booked the VIP Star Wars dessert party the other when we were in Disney for Labor Day. Had a great, it was 60 or 70 bucks a person, had a great time. Private VIP area, um, got reserved fireworks viewing. Well, Disney uh, uh, had that tracked, and in my Facebook feed, they were doing a Disney, a Disney Star Wars night in December, a trip that I was not planning on going to. And now that they've announced that, I booked my tickets, I booked a flight, and my wife and I are going to that. And it's all about this synergy. Um, the best example I can give is Disney's Magical Express. 
they give you free transportation to and from the airport. And everyone thought it was so crazy. Why are you giving free bus transportation to and from the airport? Well, they want you spending your money there. Because if you don't rent a car, you're stuck. Disney's an island, and you can't get off unless you take a taxi or an Uber. And the little bit you save on Disney's Magical Express will take care of your bags for you. You're going to get all that back from you know, uh, shopping and dining. It's that way for tickets, right? Once you get past the first four days of tickets, and you say, I want to go to Universal it's the next day. Okay, well, you have a family of four. Universal tickets are 80, 90 bucks a person. Or for $2 more, you can get another day at Disney. It's, it's this type of stuff that they're just so good at that I just really respect. But at the same time, they deliver service better than anyone. Um, I, it's palatable how different Disney cast members are to SeaWorld and Universal. And I enjoy both those parks. I have season tickets at SeaWorld, and I really enjoy it. But the, it's just second to none on the guest service. And I really think they're one of the few companies out there that put the guest first, and the money follows. They definitely look at the bottom line. But they know if they deliver top class quality entertainment, they can charge a premium for it, and it all kind of falls in together. Walt Disney said, you know, keep the parks as clean as you can keep them, treat the guests as best you can do them, give them the best experience, and the money will take care of itself. And I try to live that philosophy when I do my stuff. <laughs> it's, it's certainly like a, an awesome vision and uh, the right mentality. Uh, if if only more companies uh, embraced that uh, that philosophy. Yeah. Um, so there's uh, there was a couple other things that I was really hoping that we would discuss a little bit sure. uh, that I'm wondering whether it's dangerous to rabbit hole in them. But you did, in particular, bring up earlier the <laughs> the um, the bubbles uh, and uh, all of us in our own. Uh, niche um, open source communities and you've had uh, more exposure to uh, different open source communities than your average person and I uh, can really speak to uh, and comment on the differences in these communities and the, the value of um, interacting engaging each other the value of uh, exploring other other systems and visiting other communities and, and just broadening one's horizons. Um, so for a lot of us, myself included, uh, who might be listening to you, uh, what do you have to say? What message do you have to send about why we really should, we average users or maybe advanced users, whatever, why we really should make a concerted effort to broaden our horizons a little more get out of our own bubbles. Yeah, I mean, it's very important because nobody knows what the future may be may bring. If you would have asked uh, 12 years ago what the number one CMS was, you would have said Mambo, right? And Mambo won Linux Open Source Year, Open Source Project, Linux World's Open Source Project of the Year Award 12 years ago. It was that same weekend when the one of the members of the core team decided to personally license uh, some of the trademarks under his personal name, blah, 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 that caused the whole team to quit. Um, so you never know what the future is going to bring. And I always believe in, you know, looking outside these echo chambers. And I think there's too many people in our community, and this is true of any open source community I've ever seen. It's, it's just different players. Um, I, Joomla is the same thing where we focus too much about why we're the best and why they're the competitor and things like that, when I feel like they're not really competitors because they're just tools are tools. You'll never see Matt say, you know what, WordPress should be the go-to tool for, sci for scientific reporting um, content management systems. You know what you should use for that? Scientific CMS, which is another open source project. Um, and the cool part about this is the projects give money to, a, to groups like CMS Garden, which just stand to go out there and preach about open source at enterprise trade shows, where they're up against companies that are selling multi-hundred-thousand-dollar packages. 
and say, no, you know, look at open source. And they have reps from like 10 different projects there, not just the main three. Um, I've met so many good friends, uh, you know, in different communities and that have moved on to different communities. I think it's dangerous not to look at what else is out there. I'll give you an example in the SaaS world. A lot of people, you know, hate Wix, Weebly, and Squarespace. You know, you, you go to a WordPress event and you talk to a developer and say, what do you think of Squarespace? The first thing you get is, oh my God, oh, it's the worst thing ever, blah, 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 blah. But you know what very few people say, and I did hear Matt say this um, at US, um, something similar to this, I'm paraphrasing, you know what they have? A really freaking good user experience. Very few people acknowledge what they're good at. And they're just so focused on where they suck because they're bad and you know, I'm gonna say all this stuff. And that's how misconceptions happen. We should acknowledge what Wix, Weebly, and Squarespace are doing right and learn from it and make our own product better, which is why Gutenberg is trying to do their thing, Boldgrid's trying to do their thing, and we're trying to push it forward. But the same thing happens when we look at other projects in these communities, um, and it, even as simple as like, you know, um, that Facebook team for React. Well, Facebook's evil, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? You might not agree with where they decided, even though they did land in the direction I think is good at the end. It's their code, they can license it, but there was so much misconception about how, how, how licensing works that it just, people are kind of stuck in their own bubbles and not everything needs to be a battle. Um, there's, we have way more in common in the open source world than we have different. You know, we don't go, we don't go to Linux events. We don't go to PHP events. We don't go to JavaScript events. Why? It's, you know, Google Summer Code supports multi, all these projects including projects like WordPress and Joomla and Drupal and things, um, where they're helping college students learn how to code for these communities. The value of just diversity is so important, and you can learn so many different things. One of the best things out there is there's an um, organization called CLS, Community Leadership Summit, where leaders, you have to be in leadership of different open source projects, not just CMSs, come together and we, they talk about issues in the community. And one of the biggest issues, I ran a, um, a workshop, it was an unconference style, is you know people kind of bad mouthing and like disrespecting other users because they're new, you know, or about they're unhappy with their code or whatever, especially if the people have been around for a while, they get like a free pass to treat people poorly. Um, it's very similar to um, the talk that was done um, at Loop Conference uh, by, um, uh, by um, Andrew Norcross. He gave that talk about diversity and respect and things at, Lo at um, LoopConf. And those issues are happening in all these communities. And I think it's just because people like to, you know, make everything a battle. You know, I don't know if it's our political landscape or whatever, but, you know, we can get, we have a lot more in common than we, than we have apart. I've had people come up to me at WordPress events and say, you don't belong here because you've done Joomla. Those exact words. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, dude, come on. Tools are tools. You might be using a completely different tool in 10 years. In fact, 10 years is a long time. We don't know where the future brings. I think the future of WordPress is very bright. I'm very excited for it. But, you never know what's going to happen. And if you put all your eggs in one basket, I think you're only harming yourself in the short term. And the long term, you're going to miss out on great friendships and ideas that you can use in your own coding and development. I've never had anyone tell me that's a Joomla user who I said go to a WordPress event or a Drupal event, say it was a waste of time. And I've never had anyone who's in a WordPress community go to another community's event tell me it was a waste of time because you'll learn something. At the very least, there's always a marketing track. That's agnostic. Market, you can, <laughs> you can, those, you can use SEO ideas no matter where you, what, you, what tool you're using. Right. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, there's a lot of wisdom in that, I think. And uh, it's, uh, it's disappointing uh, that time is running short because there were more questions I wanted to dive into that, go just a little bit deeper on the topic. It's something I'm very, very interested in, and obviously you are as well. So if anybody's 
tuning into this, it, Mike's a great guy to talk to about this. If you attend an event, you will probably see Mike there. Let's start the conversation. He's got a lot more to say, let me tell you. Um, so if you don't mind, Mike, I'm going to start our kind of wrap up questions. There's yep. a few more things as the time winds down. Uh, what are some of the things uh, you like to do in your spare time, you know, when you're representing Bullgrid somewhere? Uh, big into theater. So a lot of go to a lot of Broadway um, shows, have season tickets for our Broadway series. Um, like to see what else there is in the different cities I'm in, things like that. Uh, and then video games. I always have my Switch with me at every city I'm in. And then, of course, theme parks. And if there's a theme park in the city I'm at, I'll probably find a way to get there. Um, yeah. Right on. Nice, nice. Um, uh, I always ask everybody uh, this question. Your answer <laughs> particularly will be likely interesting. Uh, what's, <laughs> what's on your calendar? Where might somebody bump into you uh, in the near future? <laughs> Um, yeah, there's a whole lot of different options. So um, I will be, right now I'm at the CPanel conference, which is in Fort Lauderdale, and then I'm going to be going over to uh, San Antonio for the San Antonio WordCamp. After San Antonio, I am going to be off for a weekend. I'm going to be home in Minnesota, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> then I'm going to be in Orlando for the Merge show, which is a really cool show done by Jothan, who ran NamesCon, and it has hosting and uh, startups and CMS Summit and all that stuff is there. After the Merge show, I'll be at WordCamp New York City and WordCamp Phoenix, Arizona, and then from the, uh, then I'll be at the WordCamp uh, Riverdale, I think, in uh, Southern California. I can never get that name correct. It's the one that's in the first weekend in November, and then, of course, WordCamp uh, or uh, Orlando, and from there, I'm flying straight to Rome for the Joomla World Conference. And I don't know what the second half of November is, and of course, I'll be at US. So, fantastic, <laughs> man! That is that's a lot. You have a lot going on. Um, do you have good recommendations for people that I might invite on the show as future guests? Uh, sure. I think it would be very interesting for you to reach out to either Jessica Dunbar from Concrete 5, the evangelist out there, to get another perspective from a different CMS to see how they you see how their community is doing and growing. Um, or Robert Jacoby, the president of Joomla, to see uh, you know the, how that works because. You know, the two projects are pretty friendly. And Matt Wielenweg did speak at the Joomla World Conference in Boston. So that's true. That's true. Um, I need to remember to shut my windows for these recordings. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, uh, this has been a great discussion, Mike. As always, I was enjoyed talking to you, hanging out with you. It's not going to be the last time. We're going to see each other plenty. Um, I'm coming out to a lot of events in 2018 and a couple more before this year's over. I'll at least see you in Nashville, and I hope a lot of other yep. friends. Um, for now, uh, what uh, uh, do, I'd like you to share how anybody could get in touch with you if they were so inclined, and maybe how they could learn more about Bullet Grid, and, and any uh, other parting thoughts you want to share before we adjourn. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you for um, having me on. Definitely appreciate it. I'm happy to spend my time, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, it was quite the honor. You can reach me on Twitter. It's probably the easiest way. I'm at MP Mike, which used to stand for Mouse Planet Mike, but I just kept it. So you can reach me on Twitter at MP Mike. You can learn about BoldGrid at boldgrid.com. You can download it, launch a free demo. There's lots of good videos on there. And then last but not least, um, you can, at any of our events that I am at, you can meet Boldy, the official mascot of Bold Grid, which is a banshee, and he'll do a selfie with you. He'll sit on your shoulder. And we're the only company with a banshee as a mascot. And you can find lots of pictures on the Bold Grid Twitter and my Twitter of Boldy. Uh, he sits at the booth, hangs out on my shoulder, so he's uh, quite the attendee. Wow. That's great. <laughs> 
<laughs> Super cool. Yeah, definitely check out the Bulgari table at uh, an event near you. Well, Mike, this has been a fun discussion. It went by all too fast. Uh, when I asked you what topics uh, you like talking about and the ones I already knew, I just knew we were not going to have enough time to cover these big topics. Uh, you've got a lot of great stuff to say. Um, but, uh, man, just flew by too quickly. Anyway, um, this has been episode 150 the WP Roundtable show. I'll be back on next Monday. And uh, thanks again, Mike, for joining me. Thank you.